In this video, I'll review briefly um, some uses of jargon in academic or scientific writing and its impact on readers. The readings for this week, especially the chapter by Helen Sword on jargonitis, which is her play on words um, in terms of you know using when you use too much jargon, as well as some of the other pieces in the required readings, will give you a very nuanced overview of some of the negative effects of excessive jargon use in science and academic writing, but also, but these texts also emphasize the necessity of using jargon at times. So my goal for you is to become really nimble and able to navigate in your own writing between moments when you might have to use a little bit more jargon and then moments where you might need to use less or absolutely no jargon at all. So let me get started on some of those um, some of those slides I've prepared for today. So I want to start off first with the definition of jargon and I've included this in the module overview as well but I wanted to walk you through it. I've taken this from the Merriam-Webster's online dictionary and there's three major areas. The first one is really the one that we're predominantly working with. It's the technical, so jargon is technical terminology or characteristic idiom of a special activity or group. So when you listen to sports captors, my husband loves basket, uh, baseball, which is not my sport of choice necessarily. I grew up in Germany and so I watched soccer my life, all my life. So the, but this, you know, when I listen with him to a game on t television, I don't understand half of the you know things that they're talking about because they're using a particular jargon for you know baseball terms and sports terms. So it's not necessarily a negative or positive term. It's just a term to describe the specific language that people in a certain field use. Now the second part of the definition here: obscure and often pretentious language marked by circumlocutions. And if you're interested in looking that up, go on the website of Merriam-Webster and um, Google that and long words. And so often this is what we find in academic and science writing where jargon is too heavily or too excessively used. Right? It's to the point where we have to read over a sentence that's usually also very long over and over to even kind of grasp the meaning. And I'm going to show you an example here that Helen Sword goes into detail or has as one of her examples as well. And I'm going to take you through a revision process for that. And then the third part of the definition, just in general, you know, outlandish, unintelligible, but hybrid language. So it's basically, it's a way of speaking, a way of expressing ourselves. That's what jargon means. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's always a bad thing. So these are three questions to keep in mind when you think about the use of jargon. Who's your audience? So if you weren't writing for a more general audience, reducing jargon is a good idea. But when you're writing, let's say you're writing in the in the Lancet, if you're a medical researcher, or in a prestigious journal in um, in dentistry or in pharmacology, you probably don't want to. You probably want to use some discipline-specific terminology that somebody else in a more general audience would identify as jargon. So the goal is not to always completely take jargon out. It's to know when to use which type of jargon for whom. So who's your audience is always in writing. It's a central question, particularly for the use of jargon. Jargon, And also in line with that, what's your genre? If you're writing a journal article or a grant application and you know that you're, there's passages in your grant application, specifically let's say the method section, where you have to get very specific and technical so that the experts on the panel reviewing your grant will be able to know that you know your material, then use, you know, jargon is perfectly fine. But also remember that when you are trying to explain a sort of general, you know, present a general overview or trying to explain maybe the impact of your study or of your research on the world or on the community, that's probably a place where less jargon serves you a lot better. And then last question to ask yourself, in line with audience and genres, what's your communication goal, right? Is your goal to educate the large, you know, the general public? Is your goal to um, impress experts? Well, those, either one of those situations, you will have to address jargon very, very differently. So again, jargon isn't all bad, but it's certainly good practice as effective science writers 
to know when to reduce jargon and when to completely take it out and when to use it judiciously and strategically. So let me share this example from you and I've put um, uh, Mike, uh, this, well, let me track back. I've taken this from a video um, on YouTube by Mike Consul. Mike Consul is a business um, writing consultant in the Bay Area on the West Coast in San Francisco and his website, you'll see at the bottom here, is myconsul.com. In our additional supplemental material section, I've added a link to his blog. He has a wonderful blog about writing. Again, this focus is mostly business writing, but he's, he has some really great suggestions. So check it out when you have a chance. So this is an example that he was talking about in this video where he worked with this company called Compugen. And Compugen wanted him to help uh, them with their website. And so they were working on their mission statement. This is the draft they sent to my console. Compugen is a leading therapeutic product discovery company focused on the therapeutic proteins and monoclonal antibodies to address important unmet needs in the fields of immunology and oncology, either for Compugen or its partners. Ooh, that's kind of a long sentence. I got a little out of breath there even reading it. So it's very long. It's very technical. Look at the words. Like It's, first of all, therapeutic product discovery company. You have a list of, uh, of three nouns. Sorry, not four nouns. Three nouns. So one adjective, therapeutic, plus three nouns, forming one word, like product discovery company. That's a lot. Very typical for science writing, right? We see this a lot. And at times, that's the only way we can express certain things. But on a website for the general public, maybe not the best idea. Um, therapeutic proteins, monoclonal antibodies, that sounds very technical to me. Um, immunology and oncology might not be terms familiar to everybody. So already, you know, by the time you get to the end of this, of the sentence, you're already throwing a lot of barriers at your reader. So my console suggestion was this. Compugen makes therapeutic products that boost the human immune system and fight cancer. Ta-da! Beautiful, to the point, and really clear. And there's a focus on active verbs, which we'll um, cover in a, in a lesson on nominalization as well. So you might see this example come up again, because I love it for a variety of, you know, to, to show a variety of science writing principles. So here, the jargon is taken out. It's been replaced by much more active, direct language. So make therapeutic products, um, this whole construction, and I, I posted the previous versions again, previous version again on the bottom here, leading therapeutic product discovery company focused on therapeutic proteins and so on. He makes it into a sentence with a very clear verb, makes therapeutic products. And then he tells, or the sentence tells me what these therapeutics do, the therapeutic products do. They boost the human immune system, right? It comes from immunology. So that replaces that specific term, and they fight cancer. So that replaces oncology, the other very discipline-specific term. Is this a sentence you probably want to have in a journal article about this topic? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe as an opening sentence and then follow up by by some more discipline-specific language. But the point here is that you know, especially when you're writing for general audience, keeping it focused, keeping it clear and direct, and leaving out some of the jargon really, you know, gets you a long way and then really helps your audience understand what you're actually trying to say and get to the meaning much more quickly than in this very long and convoluted sentences by lots of nouns covered with adjectives without any clear kind of action that's taking place. Whereas in this sentence, we know that competition makes something and this is something that they make, namely those products, they boost and they fight. Very simple. Let's look at another example, and this is from um, Helen Sword's Stylish Academic Writing. So you'll see this, if you haven't read the chapter yet, you'll see this. It's a very, very typical um, kind of sentence, more from the social sciences humanities. Examination of this constellation of representation, power, and knowledge seems all the more imperative as revising hegemony, and I'm tempted to say epistemological monopoly, of Microsoft's PowerPoint reinforces the interchangeability of content within the single representational system. Whoa, holy camoly. So there's a whole lot of going on. Examination of this constellation of representation. Again, three nouns in very close proximity combined 
um, an added power and knowledge to it as well. Hegemony is a term that, honestly, for the first three years in graduate school, I had to look up every single time. Um, epistem epistemological, I'm still not entirely sure all the time what it means. Um, I do, but it has to do with philosophical um, deliberations about where knowledge comes from. Anyways, it's a very technical term and it's almost like a show off term. So remember back, you know, if you remember back to the definition of jargon, it's more the second one where we, you know, where academics try to sound really kind of, you know, smart and um, set themselves apart from the general folk. So my attempt to rephrase this, and I'm going to have the previous version again at the bottom here, um, we must examine how images of representation power knowledge affect geographic knowledge, especially in light of Microsoft PowerPoint's dominant role in educational environments. So I left the whole little snarky kind of comment that I'm underlining right here, and I'm tempted to say for some logical monopoly in parentheses, I left that out. I'm not a big fan of using parentheses in clear, effective writing anyways, unless you're very strategic about it and you have a much more narrative piece than a certain informational analytical piece. So I've ignored that. So the point here really is about images of representation, power, and knowledge, um, how they affect how knowledge of geography is created. That's where the epistemological monopoly sort of, you know, so that comes in. But anyway, so affect geographic knowledge. And it's really about Microsoft PowerPoint's dominant role in education environments, which, you know, the rising hegemony, that's the fancier way of saying, you know, PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint's dominant role. So again, a rephrasing that maybe keeps some of the nuances off of the original version, but certainly makes it a lot easier for the reader to understand what the actual message is. So one more example. Um, to also emphasize as part of jargon, it's not just excessive use of technical, um, specific technical language, um, such as hegemony or epistemological or cardiology or oncology or something like that, but also using words that actually have a much simpler version in sort of real language. So here's a made up example. Again, the sources Smith and Johnson don't exist. If you look carefully at some of my made-up paragraphs, those are always my to-go-to references, <laughs> Smith and Johnson, whoever they are. So the sentence, it has been widely elucidated, right, that's a, that's a big no-no word for like elucidated, really, in the literature that efficacious measures, efficacious is a word that I've seen a lot of my undergraduate students use when they run out of ways to say effective in different ways. Don't do that. Efficacious is a bizarre word. It really works only in specific contexts. With efficacious measures to utilize hand sanitizers have been recommended to critical nurses to prevent the spreading of infections. So one thing I want you to also notice is there's to utilize, to critical nurses, to prevent. So a lot of add-ons that make the sentence kind of, you know, a little redundant. So what's the real message here, right? Because I'm still not sure what it is. Well, let's look at this revision. It has been widely explained. So explain is the much easier term to use for elucidate and much clearer that effective measures rather than efficacious to use hand sanitizers have been recommended to critical nurses to prevent the spreading of infections. So it's still a little, you know, yieldy and long sentence, but at least we've taken some of these slightly pretentious words out there and replaced them with much plainer language. Again, taken out some jargon. Now, another way you can even simplify this further is to just focus on the message, because it's really this whole, it has been widely explained in the literature that, especially it has been widely explained, it's not really necessary, because I don't know who it is in the first place, right? And some of the resources for today will talk about that. So the literature recommends that nurses should use hand sanitizers to prevent the spreading of infections. So if you want to go really straightforward, nurses should use hand sanitizers to prevent infections. That's really the core message here. So depending on your genre, your audience, um, some of the levels here, and I would say I would never use necessarily this version, but any of these three versions, depending on the level you're writing, might be more appropriate than another. This one here might be appropriate to use in research level writing. The last one certainly is useful for the general public. 